Good morning from the White House. I'm Jennifer Klein, and I'm the director of the White House Gender Policy Council. Thank you all for joining us here today on International Women's Day for an historic announcement and an exciting conversation with young women leaders from around the world. I'm joined here today by the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, the Acting Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Shalanda Young, and the Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development, Samantha Power. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to note the grave situation for women in Ukraine. Already, more than two million have fled Ukraine into surrounding countries, and this doesn't include those who have been internally displaced. The United States is obviously concerned about the protection of civilians in this conflict, including women and girls, some of whom are exposed to gender-based violence, LGBTQI plus individuals, as well as other vulnerable populations. This International Women's Day, we stand with the women of Ukraine fighting to defend democracy, freedom, and safety, and with the women of Russia who have dared to stand in protest. With that, I'd like to turn it over for a message from Secretary Blinken. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in from around the world. I'm sorry I'm not able to join you in person. Uh, I'm actually in Europe coordinating with our allies and partners in response uh, to the war in Ukraine and Russia's aggression there. But I want to say a few words about International Women's Day because it's an important occasion, not only to commemorate the remarkable achievement of women and girls around the world, but to remember that full and equal rights for women are key to a stable and thriving society. The data is clear. Countries are more secure, peaceful, and prosperous when people of all genders can participate fully and equitably in every sphere of public life. Economies are larger and stronger when women are equally represented. Peace deals are more likely to last when women are at the negotiating table. And countries with high levels of gender equality have stronger and more resilient democracies. That's why fighting for the rights and dignity of women and girls everywhere is critical to so much else that we want to achieve at home and around the world. Today, we'll celebrate the resilience of women who are driving progress around the world, some of whom we'll hear from shortly. And we remember that despite the progress we've made, we have so much more to do. Not a single country, including the United States, has achieved gender equality. In 2022, that's simply unacceptable. We have to redouble our efforts to advance the status of women and girls around the world. To that end, I'm excited to preview that President Biden will request approximately $2.6 billion in the 2023 budget for foreign assistance programs that support efforts to advance gender equity and equality around the world. That's more than double last year's request for gender programs. This request includes $200 million for the Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund, which will advance economic security for women and girls around the world. We'll continue to defend the rights and freedoms of women and girls worldwide, including in Afghanistan where we continue to support women fighting for their rights in education, and in Ukraine, where we're pushing for women's peace and security. At the State Department, our Office of Global Women's Issues runs programs that advance women's leadership, supports women's economic empowerment, and combats gender-based violence in 60 countries. And we'll lift up exceptional women leaders, like those here with us today, including Mira Tarazi, who is creating eco-friendly electric scooters for universities and airports. She's helping address the climate crisis and inspiring other young women in STEM to follow in her footsteps. Other leaders here today are promoting democracy across borders, preventing and responding to the scourge of gender-based violence, striving to protect children from harm online, and other urgent challenges. As their work powerfully illustrates, we need women's ideas, we need women's talents. And when they're excluded, overlooked, or ignored, we all lose out on their contributions. I want to thank our participants here today for your determination and commitment to improving your communities and countries, and everyone who tuned in from around the world. We can't wait to see the tremendous good that you do. Let's not stop until we achieve a world where women and girls everywhere are treated as full and equal in rights and dignity. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. I'd like to thank Secretary Blinken for his remarks and for his commitment to women and girls around the world. And I'd like us to especially thank him and the entire State Department 
and USAID for their work on the crisis in Ukraine. Administrative Power, Jen Klein, thank you both for your leadership. I can't imagine a better way to kick off International Women's Day at the White House than to be with these two incredible women uh, from around the world. I had the chance to really explore and fall in love with these issues while working for my longtime boss, Nita Lowy. Uh, she was the first woman uh, chair of the House Appropriations Committee after a very long history. Uh, so uh, you won't be surprised to know she has the biggest portrait in the room uh, at this point. Uh, part of her legacy that I was proud to work with her on it was her commitment to educate girls around the world by promoting basic education. And in fact, funding provided for basic education is now named in her honor, and I'm so proud to have worked with her on those issues. I also recently became a mother. I have a four-month-old girl. Uh, people tell you this is a life-changing event. I did not believe them. I believe them now. <laughs> To think of women and girls around the world who are in vulnerable situations, mothers and daughters, uh, my heart goes out in a very sincere way, and especially watching the situation in Ukraine unfold. Uh, it's unimaginable, um, and we are here uh, as partners uh, to help and assist in any way possible. President Biden often says, don't tell me what your values are. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. Our budget for the next fiscal year is going to show a lot about how the president and the entire Biden-Harris administration values women and girls. This $2.6 billion request will more than double last year's budget request for foreign assistance programs focused on gender equality. Never before has the U.S. government requested much money for this vital work, but we are doing it now uh, because we know how important it is to advance the economic security of women and girls, to get more women involved in conflict prevention, resolution, and recovery, to prevent and respond to gender-based violence. And we know that this work doesn't happen on its own. It takes resources and commitment. This is especially true uh, as the world continues to deal with COVID-19 and the devastation it's brought to communities around the world. We've seen it right here at home women and girls have been uniquely affected the past two years. The pandemic eroded 30 years of progress in women's labor force participation. It created a shadow pandemic of gender-based violence as rates increased around the world. And it did what every crisis does. It disproportionately hurt girls, especially girls of color and girls from low-income communities. That is why we're particularly excited that the $200 million we will request for the Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund will advance economic security for women and girls globally, especially those who have been impacted by COVID-19. So we have a lot of work to do together moving forward, but gender equality is worth the investment. It's not just how we lift up women and girls, it's also how we reduce poverty and promote economic opportunity. It's how we build stronger, healthier, and more stable economies. Today's historic announcement is just the beginning. My team at the Office of Management and Budget will work to make this budget request a reality, working with our partners in Congress. And we will continue our work with the State Department and USAID so that our teams around the world have what they need to make meaningful change. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Somewhere in the world. <laughs> Shows you how long I've been up. Uh, good morning here in Washington. Uh, and happy International Women's Day. Uh, so thrilling to be here at the White House, home to America's first female vice president, home to a trailblazing uh, leader of our Office of Management and Budget, who uh, not only is a budget maestro, but, but imbues that, that budget and her approach to leading OMB uh, with those values that she referenced, and those are so salient and so essential here today. So Shalanda, just great to be with you. Thank you to Jen Klein and the entire White House Gender Policy Council, not only for organizing this event, but uh, for everything you've done over this last year 
uh, to spearhead initiatives of this ambition, of the ambition that we're speaking to here today. And uh, I guess it's a happy birthday. It's one year today, I think, since, uh, since this council came into uh, existence. And really excited uh, to hear the fierce uh, trailblazing women who will be part of the panel discussion in just a bit. Uh, last week, I traveled to the border between Poland and Ukraine, where I witnessed firsthand the toll that Russia's unprovoked, horrific invasion has had on Ukrainians. In less than two weeks now, to this day, this brutal invasion has forced two million people uh, to flee the country. I was speaking to my Polish uh, counterpart not that long ago, and he was describing 100 people crossing the border every minute in, in Poland. And that number is likely to, to increase. The most salient, striking aspect of seeing people as they came across the border was that it was virtually all women and girls. Women who will now be in a position of figuring out how to provide for their rump families since the husbands, the sons, the fathers have stayed behind in order to try to repel this invasion. So this is the fastest flight of refugees in Europe since World War II, and it has summoned all of us uh, to dig deep and to think about what more we can do to stand in solidarity with women, men, children of all ages uh, to stand with the people of Ukraine. The invasion has also revealed the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I think we all see that, and especially Ukraine's women. From leading protests in the Maidan, in Kyiv, in the revolution of dignity, to fighting for pro-democratic reforms and economic integration, whether in civil society or taking that risk and going into elected politics and becoming members of parliament, to now organizing resistance efforts in cities across the country. These women have spent decades fighting for a free, independent, and prosperous Ukraine. And we are incredibly fortunate today to have one of these women, Daria Onishiko, here with us today, someone who has advocated for religious freedom and gender equality in Ukraine and is now doing everything she can to organize support for Ukrainians in Poland. I look forward to hearing from her on our panel shortly. In Ukraine and around the world, we do recognize now more than ever the importance of U.S. leadership in efforts to uplift the rights of women and girls. And with President Biden's $2.6 billion budget request for gender programming, the largest ever, we are entering a new era. This commitment, uh, if we can secure it up on the Hill, will double our current gender investments. Imagine what that will mean. It will help us equip more girls with the education that they need to achieve their dreams in accordance with Nita Lowy's vision so long ago. It will allow us to work with more men and boys to transform the harmful gender norms that so impede progress and to stamp out gender-based violence. It will advance women and girls' civic and political leadership so that more women are at the table, at every table. It's a struggle, it's a global, universal struggle to ensure greater representation and giving young women leaders the tools to take that leap and the confidence to take that leap is gonna be critically important. It will strengthen the rights of LGBTQI plus people around the world and it will help us unlock opportunities for more women to pursue good jobs, advance their careers, and support their families. But these investments won't just be numbers on a page of line items in a budget. They will drive meaningful change in the lives of literally millions of women and girls, six of whom are with us today, including Daria. In a moment, we'll hear from them about their work to ensure that gender remains core to the conversation surrounding the world's most pressing challenges, from COVID-19 to climate change to rising authoritarianism. 
Around the world, women like those assembled here continue to confront discrimination and continue to tear down systemic barriers that are holding them back or trying to hold them back. They encourage young women to run for office and engage in peace talks, lead grassroots movements to tackle climate change, and advocate for reproductive health so that women can choose if and when they want to begin or expand their family. And yet, despite the good that these and other women do, despite the mountains of evidence that investing in women's education and empower, empowerment yields dividends in everything from economic growth to peace and stability, we still struggle to produce budgets that demonstrate our belief in the potential of women and girls. Well, today, we don't just affirm the importance of unlocking that potential. Thanks to the leadership of President Biden and Director Young, we invest in it. And by doing so, we will fill the world with even more stories of powerful young women, just like the ones we are about to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sam and Shalanda and Secretary Blinken for joining us here today to highlight this an announcement, but really more importantly for all of the work that you have done and will continue to do on behalf of women and girls around the world. Now I'm delighted to turn to our special guests, six young women who are making change across the world. So with, so with us today, as you heard, Good morning. We have Darina, a Ukrainian pro-democracy leader who is currently based in Poland. Mira, an advocate from, U from Jordan who works on empowering girls in STEM. Joyce, a climate activist from Brazil. Mwansa, an advocate from Zambia working on healthcare and gender-based violence. Weiwei, who works on peace building in Burma and Morgan, a diversity, equity, and inclusion advocate from the United States. So I'm gonna kick off the conversation with you, Darina. Um, I realize, as you've heard from all of us already, um, to state the obvious, what an incredibly challenging it is uh, time for it. It is for you as a Ukrainian and for the people of Ukraine more generally. You have been an outspoken leader on combating authoritarianism and promoting democracy by increasing opportunities for young people to engage on issues related to democracy rights and inclusion, which of course is the conversation that the world is having with you right now. Um, can you share with us what are a few concrete ways that global partners can more effectively involve the rising generation of young women in civic and political engagement and leadership? Thank you. It is an honor for me to be joining this event today. Unfortunately, this International Women's Day comes at a time when Ukraine, my country, is under military attack by Russia. Thank you for kind words of solidarity, Secretary Blinken and Administrator Power. It is really wonderful to hear U.S. efforts for gender equality. I'm speaking to you today from Warsaw, Poland, that already received more than a million of fleeing Ukrainians. As the world celebrates International Women's Day, Ukrainian women are fleeing their homes with children, fighting to defend their country, and working to provide humanitarian support for Ukrainian civilians and also soldiers. Even my own mother helps territorial defense in the Western Ukraine. Their strength, bravery, and resilience are symbolic of the spirit of the nation. And the United Nations Resolution on Women, Peace and Security 1325 is more relevant than ever in Ukraine. But today and every day, we need to remember that whatever the crisis, from conflict to climate, all women and girls must live free, equal and in peace. They need to have a right to education, participate fully and meaningfully in public life, voice their opinions and enjoy human rights. And regarding your important question, I want to, say, to start with saying that young women should be recognized as equal partners in democracy rather than being only beneficiaries. 
To have meaningful engagement of youth and especially young women, global partners need to commit to a participatory process in which their ideas, experience, knowledge, and perspectives are really integrated throughout programmatic policy and also decision-making structures. It is important that young women's voices are heard without judgment, stigma, discrimination, or threat of violence. Young women should be involved in all stages and levels of program policy capacity and initiative development. This is especially true of initiatives that directly affect their lives. We need diverse representation that goes beyond tokenism and includes young women's engagement from also marginalized populations. Young women should have access to accurate information, internet, and training when it's necessary in order to effectively understand the technical content, political context, and also know the stakeholders with whom they are engaging. Also, from what I saw personally in my work, donor organizations should consider more confidence building, especially for young women from smaller cities and rural areas who have interest in politics and civic life. Then we need more connections between young women politicians, activists, journalists, and senior leaders, creating partnerships and opportunities for intergenerational dialogue and real power sharing is crucial for their successful future and also sustainable democracy as a result. Global partners, I think, need to ensure that a robust youth civil society movement is supported and well-resourced. Funding and tools should be provided in the most effective, but also respectful manner where it's possible. This also means that young women, like their adult colleagues, cannot be viewed only as volunteers. Their time and expertise is worthy of compensation. Young people overwhelmingly identify increased access to funding as their major priority, and it's especially true for young women. So my main message is recognize young women as equal partners in democracy, hear and lift their voices. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, all of what you just said is incredibly wise, um, and I hope people really um, listen to the, the very specific, very practical um, guidance that you just gave. And I, I actually just have to take a minute. I, I wasn't planning to say this, but um, but my family is actually from Ukraine. My father's parents were from Western Ukraine, and I had the chance to go visit uh, their birthplace near Ushgrad in 1990. And so um, I speak to you as a um, as a American, obviously concerned very much about the situation in Ukraine, but also there is a personal connection that I just wanted to, to share. So thank you for the work that you've done. Um, and we are all thinking of you, your family, your country. Um, Mira, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, I hear that you're the only woman engineering student at your university, um, joining the 20% of engineers globally who are women, a number that is still far too low. Uh, your love of cars, I guess, inspired you to co-develop an idea for eco-friendly transportation options. For you and the young women you mentor who are interested in pursuing careers in engineering or other STEM fields, what factors are um, important to creating the academic and professional environment where young women can participate fully? It's an honor for me to be here celebrating International Women's Day. I'm Mira Tarazi from Jordan, Global Solutions Alumni, a program implemented by IREC. Global Solution is supported by the Stevens Initiative, which is sponsored by the US Department of State. From being the only female studying automotive engineering to speed racing among males, this has been always my passion since I was a child. I have faced a lot of criticism for choosing my career. You are a girl, this is a seed for men, try something else. This is an example of what I hear on a daily basis. And this can result of female losing interest in STEM subjects. These challenges absolutely doubted me. Yet my parents and family support played an essential role in overcoming these societal gender stereotypes. Confidence is also a key. Trying to work hard to prove that you have all abilities required. My advice for females trying to excel in male-dominated fields is to always strive for more through internships, connecting with, with experts, or taking part in programs like Global Solutions, during which I have collaborated with a binational team from Jordan and US following design thinking process 
to create a sustainable business solution. We all need to work together towards encouraging women to pursue STEM careers. It, start, it starts with more exposure for both girls and boys at a young age. The sciences providing more knowledge. I have participated in a STEAM camp with She's Great, a program funded by the US Department of State and implemented by IREC. I had the opportunity to mentor girls and boys and encourage them to pursue STEM careers and advice on future universities. A male participant mentioned that he never thought that there would be a girl that's passionate about cars and automotive engineering. Therefore, exposure is important in breaking stereotypes, as well as providing an encouraging environment for girls. Also, academic institutions need to find ways to bridge between job market and their students. This will provide women with an opportunity to practice in real world. It is important to have women educators as role models in STEM fields. Women inspire each other. Professionally, we need to change the misconception that STEM careers are not family oriented when compared with others. Employers and organizations worldwide must put policies in place to provide equal job opportunities and career growth guidance. At last, I would like to address all women today. Having the courage to participate is a win. Thank you so much. I'm gonna to turn to Joyce now. Joyce, you have merged the imperative for climate action, especially on water and energy issues, with a really creative approach to encourage everyone to do their part in addressing climate change, which, as you know, better than anyone, is not a gender neutral issue. What advice do you have for global partners on how they can support women and youth led climate mo movements? Um, hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? So um, by Ishapa, it's how we say in Guarani indigenous language, hello to all of you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And yes, it's been several years working um, with local people, with vulnerable communities in climate adaptation, climate mediation, in the water, energy, and food nexus. And what I have seen and learned is that climate justice is completely intertwined with social justice. We cannot separate these two parts. And whenever we think about this gender approach, we need to understand that our local realities and the local realities, they, they also differ to one country and one region to other. So for me, it's really important also, and the and advice in the partners is that it's very important to decolonize what support means and also listening uh, the communities, uh, the youth, women um, and as well as is very fundamental in this point that we see we have uh, obviously the, the Paris Agreement and we have all these international frameworks. We need to bring this to a local perspective, to a regional framework, but with local action. And access to finance as well is fundamental in order to promote and catalyze this, local, this climate action, as well as recognizing this traditional and indigenous knowledge. As part of the solution, in mitigation and adaptation, but also as part of understanding, you know, this paradigmatic change that we need to do in order to overcome climate change and um, as well like uh, social and climate injustice. As well, we see is very fundamental to support these um, young women and youth in vulnerable communities that, as we see, they are suffering and they are in the front lines of um, the climate uh, impacts as we see, um, Till these days. And youth, especially youth, we are catalysts of transport, uh, transformation. So we need this means in order to expand our action, this capacity building, um, especially and as well as understanding the, the global perspective. As we know, what's happening is not separated as well as in our local territories. We're also suffering um, a lot of violence related to climate change. And climate change will intensify these conflicts that we already have. So this is kind of my, my perspective and advice. It would be this finance access, um, understanding the local needs, decolonizing as well what support means and capacity building for vulnerable communities and young women from around the world. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to turn now to Weiwei. You have worked to empower young people and women from marginalized communities in Burma through programs uh, that build peace and mutual understanding among very diverse groups. 
how can the international community better protect women in or affected by armed conflict? Thank you very much. And it's a thank you very much for your questions. Today, I am honored to be here with my fellow women leading our global calls for change. Seeing you all here committed to making our world a better place, I am even more inspired. From Ukraine to Burma, the international community's comprehensive and timely support is essential for us women to build our movement for peace, justice, and equality. This is because our limited capacity and shrinking space for civil society cannot ensure that critical resources will be readily available and accessible. Our deep contextual knowledge with our communities, as well as our collective experience combating patriarchal norms are indeed what distinguish us from our world stakeholders. Yet, without their sustainable aid, it is challenging to maximize what we have to achieve what we want. As a human rights activist from Burma, I myself personally has, have confronted these challenges for nearly a decade since my seven years as a political prisoner. My organization, Women's Peace Network, have faced many barriers in empowering youth and women across the country or fighting against discriminations or in building peace among different uh, ethnic communities. Especially when involving my community, the Rohingya, the most persecuted community in the world, one of the most persecuted community in the world, these barriers were deeply systematic. And these barriers include accessibility to resources and sometimes can become a threat to our life and security. When women are at serious risk of losing their life to war crimes and other mass atrocity crimes, they cannot be left alone. This is the case with my country where the Burmese military has used weaponized sexual violence against ethnic minorities for decades and wield it against the entire population since they attempted coup last year. In time like this, the international community must immediately act to protect these women, including by fulfilling responsibility to protect principles and upholding the women's peace and security agenda. Countries must immediately provide effective relief and recovery, including by providing psychosocial support and livelihood support, and by enabling cross-border aid for those forcibly displaced and upholding the principles of non refoulement Resources, which include materials and financial support, must be provided to the women's groups and other community-based organizations so that a sustainable path to recovery can be built. Countries such as the US, United States, must hold the perpetrators of international crimes accountable to prevent recurrence of such crimes and bring justice for the survivors. And this process must include atrocity determinations as well as tool to cut all lifeline to the perpetrators of these atrocities. For Burma, international community must take leadership by making a genocide determinations for Rohingya and imposing sanctions on Myanmar oil and gas enterprise and enforcing global arms embargo. Addressing the root causes of violence and armed conflicts and recognizing such atrocities, including violence against women as they are, is the only way we can achieve gender equality, sustainable peace and security for all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Weiwei, for, um, for again, for your sharing your experiences. And, and again, your very, very practical and, and very substantive uh, thoughts there. Um, I'm going to turn to Morgan now. You've worked to highlight the stories of powerful women of color throughout history to ensure that young girls of color learn about the lives and work of role models from their own communities and to help all of us appreciate the impact of these important women in history. So as we mark Women's History Month, um, as well as uh, International Women's Day, 
and as Samantha said, the first anniversary of the Gender Policy Council. Tell us what recommendations do you have for educating young people and inspiring the next generation of girls to advance uh, greater equity and inclusion? First, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And to answer the question, I believe that to inspire the next generation of girls, we need more inclusive curriculum in schools and more opportunities to build the problem solving and leadership skills that I gained from being in programs like Girl Scouts. Seeing modern day women of color and those from the 20th century in textbooks can and likely will effectively encourage girls to continue to strive for equity and inclusion. While we need to learn to talk about sheroes like Harriet Tubman from the 19th century. I think it's also time to start highlighting and showcasing women of color like Kalpana Chawla, Tammy Duckworth, and Corazon Nakino, who are confident and courageous from the 20th and 21st century. Educators need to feature more women of color role models in schools to foster a sense of belonging and to give girls confidence and the courage to dream. The United Nations theme for this year's celebration is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Gender equality is so important because it is our unique differences, perspectives, and knowledge that will bring about the creative solutions that this world needs for issues like climate change, war, and more. We need to make sure that young girls all over are seeing representation of themselves, that they feel empowered to share their voice and ideas, and as Girl Scouts say, be the girls the world needs. It's been said that you cannot be what you cannot see. And that has definitely been the case for me as a passionate African-American female who cares deeply about my community. I have always loved history, but when I looked through my history books and classes, I didn't always see any stories of the women that helped shape the country that looked like me. Too many women, and especially minority women, are being undervalued, ignored, and not represented. And that's why I created a project for my Girl Scout Gold Award, which is a sustainable project meant to make the world a better place, called Learning Her Story. I created a website and an Instagram page to highlight women of color to encourage girls and show them that there are women, specifically minority women, that have done and are still doing amazing things. Women like Ida B. Wells, a journalist, activist, and researcher who battled things like sexism, racism, and violence, who used her voice to shed light on the conditions of African Americans throughout the South. Or Ibtihaj Muhammad, an American saber fencer who was the first Muslim American to wear a hijab while proudly representing the United States in the Olympics. And there are so many more incredible women who have made history like Ilhan Omar, Katani Jackson, Kamala Harris, Mae Jemison, and Patricia Bath. And some of those women I had never heard of until recently or until I began my research for my Gold Award. And our goal should be to change that for the future generations of girls to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and last, I'm gonna turn to Mwanza. Um, you have advocated for sexual and reproductive health rights and services and ending gender-based violence. How can development efforts better address the needs of young people, especially young women in healthcare, particularly with respect to how health systems are designed and how healthcare is actually delivered? Uh, Mwanza, can you hear us? I see you. Hmm. Okay, all right, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, wait, try one more time. We can't hear you. Hello? There you go. So glad okay. we could hear from you. <laughs> Such a privilege for me to... Oh no. Wansa, I'm so sorry, but we can't hear you. Um, so we're gonna continue this conversation another time and we are going to make sure and even hope that you can be in person with us. Um, I hope sitting among all these people and making an impact in their communities and the world. Elected in health systems, teams. So gender is a key social stratifier that is affecting health systems needs, experiences as well as outcomes. So it is important for us, gender being healthcare rather, being something that stems or rather that is 
was designed, the health systems rather were designed by males in the past. So in most cases, you, you find that the, the design of the healthcare systems does not necessarily suit the women. And in our global health leaders, we have about 70% of our global health leaders who are men. So in as much as the men are representative of all these policies that are being created, the policies are not necessarily meant to suit and 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 one of the barriers that I realized that I came across during my research and during the work that I've been doing here in Zambia is that there's a gender bias in our healthcare systems. So one of these gender bias gender biases um, is a disbelief in the and the symptoms of women. Women are experiencing a lot of problems in the healthcare systems or accessing healthcare services. Also because they're social economic minority, it is very difficult for them to go and access these services. So we need our healthcare system, we need our primary healthcare to be more accessible, to be available for these women, to be accessible by these women, to be acceptable. They need to be treated with dignity in these healthcare uh, facilities and they need to be able to access quality healthcare. That is the only way that we're going to be able to attain universal health care for all. So I believe that we need, we have a lot of work to do. We need to be deliberating the policies that we, we are creating. We need to make sure that we have available funding that is pushing for the provision of healthcare services for all and not just for the uh, privileged communities. We also need to ensure that we have awareness because most people, people, most women rather, are experiencing a gender bias and they're unaware that they're experiencing these things. So we need to be able to invest in our education because I believe healthcare and gender are cross-cutting issues. So we need to be able to invest. We need to be able to be deliberate in the policies that we create. We need to be able to create facilities that are available for all people so it's, it's an example that I would give is if you, you built a hospital in a rural area and some of the people in the rural area are unable, and are unable to access it, then we are literally, we are literally solving nothing by doing that. So we need to be deliberate in the policies that we are making and we need to ensure that the funding is, is directed into the, into the, the resources that are directed into proper resources so that they are able to, so that, everybody is able to access these services and that women and girls are represented in all areas of the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. We got all, but uh, most, but not all of what you said, um, but I wanna thank you for, um, for, for sharing. Um, and I wanna thank all of you. I mean, I think the, that it, it is entirely obvious that the, mo the best investment we can make is in people like you, um, women who are doing great work to advance gender equity and gender equality around the world. And you are the best investment. The work you have done and will continue to do is incredibly meaningful. So let me end by thanking all of you um, and others like you, by the way, who are out there doing the work. Um, and to thank my colleagues again for um, taking the time to um, be with us and to announce this historic investment in the future. Um, so thanks very much and um, happy International Women's Day. <laughs>